The song starts, fear, you're just a name that I have learned, another way for me to turn, and you brought me here. It took years for me to find that you were only in my mind. I've been looking in the wrong place, couldn't see what I've always known. I was facing the wrong way. I missed it all. And I don't care what they all say. Let me find my own way home. I don't care if my heart breaks. All I want is love. You know, I don't come by a song like that naturally, or so it felt. I mentioned that my relationship with surrender <laughs> has not been um, one of surrendering to life unfolding perfectly, one of surrendering to this idea that, that, that there's beauty in surrender, that it's walking by faith when we're in surrender. For me, it felt like the last resort it felt like those moments, you know, Ernest Holmes talks about hope being better than despair. And for me, surrender was like the last, like my last option before I opened to the more. And what I realized is hope is that first seed of possibility. It's the first seed of love and surrender makes that possible. What I also didn't realize as I was making my journey, the thing is, is like each month there's a topic, right? There's, we have a theme. Last month was fun. I love fun. I'm good with fun. Nobody asked me to speak on fun. <laughs> like, I feel like there's some divine conspiracy that I'm only asked to get up here and speak on the subjects where I'm like, I don't like that one. Let's pick a new one, right? Um, and, and I've recognized that that is, um, that's how I surrender, right? That is surrender. That's allowing my edges to soften. That's allowing myself, when I look at becoming somebody who can resonate so profoundly with a song that is all I want is love, um, when I, you know, I remember making a conscious decision. I was nine years old when I put my heart on lockdown. Locked down, threw away the key, would rather experience nothing than to experience the fear of the unknown, the fear of the love, the fear of putting myself out there. I was going to keep myself safe and I was going to navigate life my own way. And that felt powerful, right? Surrender to me felt weak, surrendering my power over to somebody else, surrendering my power to something else. But in this nice, safe, heart locked up tight, I was the powerful one. And it served me. Here's the thing about surrender is often those getting down on your knees moments are the moments when what we've done hasn't served us, right? And so as long as it's continuing to serve us, we continue to keep doing what we're doing. <laughs> um, and it made me very successful. It made me make choices in my life that, um, you know, I don't know that I would have been as open and receptive to somebody who is loving, as loving and um, allowed me to be who I am as much as my husband is, had I not been so terrified of opening myself to love. But it also created social anxiety it created um, a very much a feeling of me versus them, that, that I was in the right and you, like I needed to keep everybody at bay and it put a mask on. And it was um, probably during, <laughs> well, <laughs> true confession, when I first met Dr. James, he was like, wow, you are a tough nut to crack and this is not gonna be a good time for me having you in practitioner and ministerial. And then he spent the next several years, like, you know, you're funny and you're smart. Could you just get rid of the edge? <laughs> like, what are we doing here? Like, um, and I was just locked up, 
right? And so I began this process of how do you get from locked up to surrender? How do you get to a place where you're open to love, where you're receptive to it, where all you want is love? Um, <laughs> and funnily enough, it, it <laughs> came to me via a relationship with a tree. Um, I feel the need to say that I am not one who has relationships with trees. I am not a, you know, I'm not a hippie. I'm not, a, you know, n not that there's anything wrong with that. It's just, I don't know that how many people who actually know me would believe that I actually have a relationship with a tree. And so we're going to go with the story, okay? So in this journey, I started to discover that there are really only two emotions. There's love and there's fear. If I'm angry, I'm afraid of something. If I'm feeling shame, I'm afraid that I'm not enough. If I'm feeling almost any feeling that doesn't bring me joy and lighten my soul, if I back it up, it's almost always gonna come down to fear. And if I'm feeling love, we all know what love feels like, right? It's when we're tapping into that creative energy of the entire universe, when our soul just feels alive, when we feel that peak cloud, that infinite possibility, right? And when I'm being bold and daring, I'm tapping into that creative energy. That's love. When I'm feeling connected, when I'm feeling oneness, that's tapping into love. So there's love and there's fear, right? So I was having a very hard time with what I know now is that I was struggling to love myself because I had so much fear about allowing myself to be seen. But I was in ministerial, and I'm pretty confident that I was not getting that certificate in the reverend in front of my name until I had started to knock down some of these walls. And I was on a walk and I remember just bawling, just bawling. It was all coming out, this recognition of who I had become up until this point and this profound, deep sadness that I didn't think I could get there. And I stumbled across this tree. <laughs> and this tree was short and stout little teapot, can't relate to that, and it was um, covered in spikes. It had no leaves, and it was covered in spikes. I mean, it looked like a tree you do not want to mess with. This was a very badass tree. And, <laughs> and I remember coming across it, and I'm bawling and blurry, and I see all these spikes, thorns, all over this tree, and it, and I, the thought that came to me was, and yet it's still a tree. All those spikes on the outside, all those barbs, all those things that keep it safe from predators, it is still a tree. And it was the first time that I had recognized that I am still all of the love and all of the creativity and all of the goodness and all of those things. And it was the first wellspring of learning to love myself without needing the love of somebody else, as the song says. And so I started, like, I, sometimes I would feel like the tree was just saying, like, hey, come walk by me, check me out. And I was like, all right, this is really weird. Don't tell anybody that you're having a relationship with a tree because they're going to commit you. This is not good, right? And so the next time that I walked by the tree, it had started to grow leaves, and I stopped by, and I'm like, I'm going to admit, I waited, there were cars passing, and I kind of, like, waited for them to pass, and then I was like, hey, tree, what's up? How's it going? Like, looking good, <laughs> like, last time, I, you know, and, and then went on my merry way, and sometimes I, I can't explain it. I'll go on a walk, and I, I feel like I need to go visit my tree, but as this month of surrender was coming up, and I was realizing <laughs> I better have something to say when I get up here, it's going to be really awkward for all of us, um, 
I went on that walk and I went on my nature walk. And what I found this time, you know, it is really, really, really easy to succumb to fear and to forget that the love of the universe is what can heal. It is sometimes, I'm going to be honest, surrendering to that love. I want to fight. I want, I want to stand up for the little guy. I want to make a difference. I want to make a change. And sometimes that call to action to be a minister and to be deeply rooted in love no matter what, there are days that that is so easy. There are days that I ride that pink cloud and I feel like I can feel it and I feel oneness and I feel connected. And I have to be honest with you, there are days when I need my tree to remind me. <laughs> there are days when it does not feel so easy. And so <sighs> I was trying to um, just live with surrender, to surrender to surrender, to surrender to that energy of surrender. Um, and I was walking through my neighborhood on the walk and we're on a water restriction, so nobody can water their lawn. And so my neighborhood that is normally green and lush and beautiful with gorgeous lawns is just brown. I was like, this seems like kindling for like the Santa Ana. Like the, it was just, it, and I was like, and I was feeling less inspired because I didn't have this gorgeous backdrop. It, it looked very brown. And I was like, I have nothing, I, I have nothing. And then I stumbled upon my tree, um, which by the way, <laughs> smacked me in the head because I was so lost in my thought about how the fact that the lawns weren't getting enough water that as I was coming across my tree, I didn't look up and I got smacked in the face with the branch of the tree. It was like, hey, I'm here because I have a relationship with a tree. So. When I looked at my tree, everything was brown. Everything, everything was brown. Except my tree, this barren tree that had no leaves on it and that had spikes everywhere, was in full bloom with these gorgeous, lush green. Apparently, these types of trees, although I still can't figure out what kind of tree it is, thrive when there's no water. Or maybe it's thriving because I love it. Or maybe in the quantum universe, I'm healing it, it's healing me. All right, I'm not gonna get too crazy with the tree. Having a relationship with a tree, that's enough. But the point is, the tree was beautiful. Um, I was trying to pull a picture. I was having difficulty. I could stop by, I have pictures of my tree on the phone. Um, in the midst of what felt like barren and ugly and no green to be found, this tree was thriving. Which reminds me and reminded me, which one am I gonna surrender to? If there's only two emotions, if there's only fear and there's only love, am I focusing on the brown lawns or am I focusing on the big beautiful green tree that is thriving without water? Which makes no logical sense. Here's the thing about the brain. The brain, in addition to a lot of amazing things that it does, um, it's one of its primary functions is to just keep us from doing things that'll kill ourselves. Like it's literally like it records things we haven't experienced and it goes, oh, that, you know, the first time we approach a hot stove, we don't know it's hot, we have no, you know, no idea of what's gonna happen. And we touch the stove and the brain goes, oh, that's hot, you burned yourself, and it stores it. And so the next time that you come across a hot stove, the brain says, oh, we know this, that's hot, don't touch that. And, and we know not to stop, not to touch it. Now behind the brain is also the thinker. And so the thinker gets to decide what it's gonna do with that information, right? And so some people, if you're Reverend Liza, you might go, I'm not sure it actually was so hot. I don't believe that that stove is hot. I'm gonna to touch it again, right? And if you're me, you might go, oh my God, all stoves are bad. Let's never use a stove. It's takeout for me for the rest of my life, right? Because what we decide to do with it, but the brain is constantly, all it is doing, 
is scanning. It's not even seeing everything. It's not even seeing everything clearly. It is just scanning for the key pieces of information and the things that it needs to keep us safe. And so it's really easy to give in to that fear because our brain is constantly telling us that, that it's doing us a favor, it's keeping us safe. And then it gets even worse when we go on autopilot, right? When we allow the brain to take over, the thinker's not even there. And so the title of my talk, What's Love Got to Do With It? Right? Where does the love come in? You know, I've been looking at this idea that logic, and we use our brains so much, and there's not a problem that I can't solve with my brain or with my anger or with my rallying. And, and I, I get so consumed with how smart I am. And I, and I think we all do that, right? Like we all, and it causes this disconnect. Where is the oneness when I'm using my brain to walk around my life? Where is the oneness when I'm allowing my brain to let the fear of some hazard dictate how I'm going to behave and how I'm going to act in the world? Where it, you know, I, <laughs> how many times have you gotten into a Facebook argument and felt like you walked away clearly with the other person understanding and having a changed point of view? We cannot use the same mind that created the problems in the first place to try to solve them. That's where the love comes in. You know, it's interesting. I have been, um, as I said, there are days where it's easier to be a minister than others. And lately in the world, I have had to really make conscious choices. Am I surrendering to the fear or am I surrendering to the love? And there are a lot of times in the world where it feels like oneness is great when we experience it in here on a Sunday, but if we're not experiencing it when we walk out those doors, we are doing something wrong. There has to be a bigger power at play. There has to be an even bigger surrender. And, you know, there's a lot going on in the news right now, and there's a lot of things that can take me off of my game and, and whatever, and, and so... It's, Standing steadfast in that surrendering to love has been the thing. Because when James made the theme surrender, and I was like, I don't like that one, let's pick a new one, I knew that what it, was, it was a call to action for me to surrender to that energy of surrender, right? So shortly after I had seen my giant green tree and all of its life, I got home and um, you know, there's a lot going on with, you know, the senators trying to preserve, pr preserve and protect gay marriage. And um, I saw a news article where CNN was interviewing a bunch of different senators and asking them um, what their, how they intended to vote for this bill. And it was pretty predictable. Um, you can, you know, figure out where that landed. But there was one senator that stood out. Rob Portman is a Republican senator from Ohio um, who had been, all I read in the article was that Rob Portman said, I will be voting yes to preserve gay rights. As you know, my, um, my stance on this has changed over the last few years. Now, that's not something you see every day. <laughs> that's not a statement that I, I was the last time you were, you know, I think about family members arguing at Thanksgiving, like nobody walks away with a changed mind. They just walk away with resentment, right? Um, and so I had to investigate and I had to know more. I had to know what, what had happened. And so um, I did a little bit of research. Rob Portman was, a, was staunchly against gay marriage. He was staunchly in the Republican camp of being against it and was actively working on bills to, um, to have marriage be between a man and a woman. Um, and then his son came out. And Rob Portman, because of the love of his son, because of the energy of love, changed his stance 
because the love of his child, that connection, that love, changes things. Love changes things. It wasn't, and I am, I am pro-marching for what you believe in and standing up strongly for what you believe in. I am 100% in support of expressing yourself and your values and your views in any way that you see fit, but it just struck me that all of the people who had been saying and clamoring to be heard and marching and all of those, th and, and the, the loudness of people saying, don't take away my rights, had very little effect. But the love of one child, one human being in his life, impacted God knows how many people. That is the power of love. And it's a call to action for me if I am given the choice in any moment to surrender to fear or to surrender to love, I choose to surrender to love. I choose to believe that while our heads are designed to keep us safe, our hearts are designed to take us to new heights. The call to action is to love. So what's love got to do with it? Love has everything to do with it. Namaste.